Hey, welcome back to Midas Letter Live on this legalization day. It's uh, Mike Gornstein is here. He's the CEO of Kronos Group. Mike, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mike, tell me, how has uh, legalization changed the outlook for Kronos? This is something we've been looking forward to for a long time. We're extremely excited about. You know, for us, this is, it's really a watershed moment and it, it, it you know, means a few things. I think the first, you know, the world is watching Canada and we really believe that this is, is something that's going to be a huge catalyst. There's a, a global tailwind that we see and this gives us the opportunity not just to start getting products out into Canada and, and you know, start being able to really feed customers that we've been, you know, been looking forward to for years, but also to pilot products and being able to scale them across our global platform as other markets come online and take, uh, you know, take Canada's lead and follow it. Mm -hmm. Cool. So there's a lot of, two, there's sort of two camps out there. One camp says that this is all going to end in tears like the dot-com era and the markets overbought and it's mm -hmm. just a matter of time. Then there's the other side that says, no, this is actually the evolution of a product, the likes of which humanity has never seen before and this mm -hmm. is just the beginning. Which camp are you in? Uh, I'm in the latter and I would say that you know, it's the evolution of a product, but it's, it's one that at least the base of it, the, the original you know, sort of non-disruptive product, mm -hmm. the world has seen and the world certainly uh, uses and there's a ton of demand for it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think we're going to see that, that continue to progress as we get into you know, more innovative form factors. Uh, you'll see this market continue to grow. And you know, if, if you're looking at it, as, and I think people just start looking at the industry and go, well, let's, let's look at, at where things are and you know, how many people are in Canada, but you miss that you know, the, the Canadian LPs are really global companies now. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just an opportunity to keep expanding and you know we're we're very excited. This is it's really still the beginning. Well, all right. Um, so, where can we buy Kronos products as mm -hmm. of October seventeenth? You'll be able to to either go into stores in Nova Scotia, uh, PEI. You can of course go into uh, you know store in BC or order online. Mm -hmm. Same with Ontario, and then medical patients across Canada, and. Uh, and, you know, unless you're, you have viewers in Germany, right. uh, we'll okay. stick with just Canada today. Very cool. Um, so you brought some uh, some product here. Yeah, I, I brought I brought you a, a you know a gift for uh, oh, I love for presents. October seventeenth. It's uh, look at that. That's gorgeous packaging. Is this uh, something that one can purchase? Whoa, <laughs> whoa! Functional food. I see what you mean. It's a chocolate bong. How about that? Now, is this something that we can buy online at Kronos right now? Uh, this, is, this is not. This is, uh, you know, when we think of Ooh. Cove, the brand, it's really about making each experience a discovery. So right. you'll see a lot of things where, you know, it's not, again, just selling flour. It, it's, it's discovering new experiences. We really take an explorer mindset. And so, you know, there are a lot of different things we do with the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's really overall about building this relationship with the consumers, focusing on the experience. and. You know, we have a lot of interesting things in store. Sure. So this isn't something I could actually pack that bowlful and light her up, is it? Uh, you, you should. I think you probably can. Really? Yeah. Uh, Wouldn't melt the chocolate? No, I guess not. No. Eh? It's uh, interesting. I mean, look, we can't infuse chocolate for another year or so. It doesn't mean that you can't. But uh, good point. What you do, we're disclaiming anything. So that that's up to you. Sure. Uh, one of the one of the questions I'm asking all the LPs on this his historic day is: uh, Are you guys going to be in the market of uh, of supplying uh, clones to people who want to grow at home or seeds or anything like that? It's something we actually do for medical patients through Peace Naturals and you know we have for you know for quite a long time but as far as the recreational market our, our focus uh, is really on flour pre-rolls pre and oil. So if I was a medical patient client mm -hmm. of Kronos I could order four clones? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. oh, well I'm going to sign up tomorrow. <laughs> I'm feeling very painful in my back. Um, <laughs> Interesting. So you guys have really uh, started to make some lateral moves in the industry, and, and I'm really interested, in, particularly in the uh, the Ginkgo BioWorks mm -hmm. one, because of the implications. And obviously, the sort of objective of that is sub penny per gram of input cost for cannabinoids or something mm -hmm. like that. Is that accurate? Y you know, for us, the the objective we really think about. You know, what's the vision? Where do we want to end up? You know cost of production is really execution of that vision and for us it's being able to have something that's consistent, something that's scalable and really something that allows us to differentiate the products. Mm -hmm. So being able to get access to these other cannabinoids 
uh, you know, THCV, CBC is very, very important to being able to give people different experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's really that, that focus on different occasions that we care about. And certainly, you know, in order to do that and make the products affordable, it does help to be able to have a, a more efficient you know, input cost. Right. Um, so tell me about how the Ginkgo system works. Like, how does, what is the process that they actually <laughs> employ? I know I'm comparing it for the sake of comparison to Hyacinth Bio, who mm -hmm. grows cannabinoids using uh, genetically modified yeasts and enzymes. Mm -hmm. How does that compare to Ginkgo's system? So, you know, Ginkgo, it's a, it's a unique platform. It's, a, it's an, established, an established sort of D, it's the largest printer of DNA in the world. Mm. So between 38 and 40 percent of the world's DNA is actually printed by Ginkgo. Mm. Uh, and really what, what they're doing, they have this metagenomic library. And if you think, you know, what a metagenomic library is, it's all these different, you know, different organisms in nature. And it's really a database they can search through. And what we've been doing at Kronos over the last year and a half, two years, is doing genomic sequencing of all the different genetics that we have. Hmm. And we've mapped out the actual metabolic pathways, how the biosynthetic pathway, how is THC produced, how is CBD produced, what enzymes, what mutations change that efficiency. We're then cross-referencing it, and about like you know, a quarter of Ginkgo is actually their computer programmers. Mm -hmm. right? So it was founded by five MIT PhDs and mixed between biologists and artificial intelligence guys. So it's really the sorting through that data and then figuring out what are the most efficient, uh, what are the most efficient genes really that you're gonna put into a cell mm -hmm. and you're printing different DNA sequences. And what's unique about Ginkgo is really the speed at which they can test out these strains. You know, so tens of thousands you know, in, in a month and it's the highest throughput we've seen. So you're basically siphoning through all these different uh, all these different potential strains mm -hmm. and picking what the most efficient one is. And similar to you know, Hyacinth, any company that would biosynthesize really anything, you're using engineered yeast. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's really important isn't just the yeast, it's, it's what's the actual DNA you're printing. So mm -hmm. rather than doing this by hand, like PhDs would do, you know, going, okay, let's move liquid to liquid and see what happens, you're using a, a whole system of automation, robots, and, and, and really a computer program to be able to accelerate that. Hmm. So better chance of knowing what you're going to get as opposed to seeing what you get after the fact. Right, it's, it's increasing your shots on goal mm -hmm. and I think that's what's important and, and really half of the work is done because of what they've done with terpenes. Sure. And I think we've talked about before what they did with, uh, with Robert A and rose oil and being able to make these different terpenes and you know that's applicable. You can use a lot of that technology, a lot of that code base. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just like you know, computer programming, sure. right? When, when a lot of the work for a website's already done, you can still pull from that code. Right. And DNA is really just a code. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So then does that mean at some point in the near future I'm going to be able to look at my wall and say, joint, white widow, 15%, <laughs> joint size, you know, X for one, and it pops up like a replicator on Star Trek? Well, what we're doing, if you think about what white widow is, mm -hmm. right, like what, is, what, is any, what do any of these strains mean? Mm -hmm. Is, and, and there's probably 50 different white widows you know, what is it? What is it? It's really you pick a strain, and if you want to know what's really in that strain, you take it a uh, HPLC machine. You, you know, go in one of the labs, and you can test it out. And you HPLC? find HPLC. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's one of the methods for lab testing. Okay. So, you go to a lab, you test something out, and you find out there's X percent THC, CBD, CBC, THCV, and a lot of these minor cannabinoids really do, it's what people refer to as the entourage effect, but they, they really, it's like the ingredient list. Mm -hmm. So once you understand that ingredient list, you could pick the best white widow you've ever had, and as long as we have the opportunity to take that, test it, we can then replicate that using different cannabinoids and terpenes. Hmm. Okay. But, so we won't actually be making the flower. Right. Flower still be grown and, you know. Uh, okay, so you're just making the elements. So, right, so one of the things we do now is strain-specific extraction. So mm -hmm. our oils will replicate the effects you would have from the flower because we take out the terpenes, take out the cannabinoids, and we then recombine them to give you, you know, that same experience. Hmm. We can then, instead of having to extract from the plant, accomplish the same goal by using biosynthesis. So I guess this has profound implications for medical science in that we identified hmm. some of these minor cannabinoids have a very positive effect <laughs> on certain cancers and yep. other sort of life-threatening illnesses. Absolutely. And is that yeah. sort of part of Kronos's game plan is to mm -hmm. focus on perhaps the generation of proprietary molecules that you can patent as a medical 
sort of biopharma company as a result of this relationship? You know, that's, that's certainly part of a, you know, a bigger picture strategy. What we're actually doing right now, these cannabinoids, they exist in the plant today. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that's important for path to market is that you know, under the Health Canada regs and what we expect those regs will be mimicked elsewhere is it's a phytocannabinoid. So the THC that we're producing is, the, is identical to the THC that you would get from a plant. Mm -hmm. It's not a synthetic, it's just you know, biosynthesis happens inside of plants. Sure. So we're really producing the same cannabinoids, it's just the efficiency and the purity that we're able to accomplish it at. And instead of having to build massive grow facilities and massive extraction labs everywhere around the world, we can go to use existing infrastructure and really replicate it. Mm -hmm. But you know, what's important is how do those cannabinoid mixtures work together to deliver the effects you're talking about? You know, what we've seen is it's not just cannabinoid isolates. So that's actually work uh, you know, we're doing in Israel right now for topicals, for example. Mm -hmm. We're actually creating organoids, which basically is a, we're creating a cell. So you create a disease cell with acne, for example. And once we have this, this organoid, we're using all these different iterations of cannabinoids in isolation and in combination to understand what actually will unblock pores. So it's the same thing, you're using data and you're getting more shots on goal. Mm -hmm. Rather than having a theory testing it out over years, we can actually accelerate that model. Hmm, that is some fascinating shit right there, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, so, okay, so how soon till you actually roll out a product with biosynthesized cannabinoids mm. in lieu of plant-generated cannabinoids? Sure, so, you know, we, we say three years is the timeline for commercial scale. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what we've seen is that can rapidly accelerate, especially given Ginkgo's platform. You know, that's a, a, sort of an assumption based off of how many iterations till we get to you know, what we think is the optimal strain. Mm -hmm. It's possible that it's earlier, but I think that's the, that's the time frame that we, you know, we use and it, it's really, it's probability, not a certainty. Right. It's not, uh, but that's, that's, I think, our best estimate. Okay. Well, it sounds like, as ever, you guys have a, mi a million things going on and it's fascinating to hear about it all the time. Mike, uh, we'll come back to you again in due course. Thanks for joining me today. All right, hey, thanks for having me.